Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. Episode 54, Stories of Plants. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Neville, Elizabeth and Aaron. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. The Kumara. Of all the foods which were known to the Māori, there was none so highly regarded as the kumara, or sweet potato. It was not like fern root, or pūwha, or berries which could be gathered as they grew on the plains or in the forest. The tubers had to be planted in carefully prepared soil, and kept weeded and free of caterpillars. There were ceremonies and rites to be observed if the kumara god were to watch over his crop and care for it. When they came to Aotearoa, the Māori brought some of the prized tubers with them, or else they came in some miraculous fashion. Once upon a time, the kumara was not found anywhere on earth. It lived in the sky under the protection of the star Whānui. In those days, there was a married couple, Rongo Māui and Pani, who lived in the land of Mataora. They heard that the wonderful food could be formed in the far-off places of the sky. Rongo left his wife and climbed up to heaven, where he found the star god in his home. He asked him to give him some of his treasured children, the kumara tubers, but Whānui refused. They are mine, he said, and they will remain with me forever in my home. Rongo Maui went to the corner of the whare, He lay down on a sleeping mat and pretended he was overcome by fatigue after his long journey. He closed his eyes and began to snore. Whānui kept awake for a time, but presently his head began to nod. Rongo opened his eyes and looked at Whānui, who was sitting with his back to the wall and his chin on his breast. He sat up slowly, but Whānui did not move. He stood up and tiptoed across to the star god, but still Whānui did not stir. Inch by inch, his hand crept across to the basket by the god, and his fingers gathered up a few tubers. He moved quietly down the whare, slipped out of the door, and closed it softly behind him. Once outside, he moved in a frenzied haste, lest Whānui should waken and discover that some of his kumaras had been taken. As such, he scrambled back to earth. It was the first time that anything had ever been stolen in land, sea or sky, but it was a theft which was of great benefit to mankind. Whānui does not forget his children who have come down to earth though. When he first appears as a twinkling speck of light in the eastern sky, the wise men of the tribe know that the time for planting the kumara has come, and that the star will smile on them when they make the holes ready to receive the tubers. Rongo Maui has become the father of the kumara, and Pani is its mother. There have been other kumara plantations in the sky. One of them was kept by the god Maru, who was a relative of Maui, whom he had invited to stay with him before he returned to his mother and brothers. Maui grew from childhood to young manhood in the country of the sky, and learned many arts which were useful to him later in life. He saw that Maru had a fine crop of kumara, So, he cleared another patch of ground and planted a crop for himself. One day, he went to see how Maru's kumara was faring, and discovered that the plants were bigger and more healthy than his own. He was jealous of his relative's success, and used his magic powers to create a heavy fall of snow. The snow and the bitter winds which followed shriveled the leaves of Maru's plants, while Maui's remained healthy. Maru saw what had happened and worked hard to save his crop, but only a few survived in a sheltered corner of the plantation. He knew very well that the evil had come from Maui. Summoning the caterpillar tribe, he set them to work. They went in their thousands and ate every plant in Maui's plantation, leaving him without a single kumara. It was a feast which gave them an appetite for the leaves of the plant, and Māori workers must always be vigilant in picking them from the leaves, lest the plants suffer the same fate as Māori's garden. The Cody and the Whale 
The greatest of all ocean dwellers, except the fabulous monster which swallows the seas, causing whirlpools which destroys canoes and men, is Tohora, the whale. On land, the mightiest living thing is the Kodi, the giant tree of the northern lands, which stands straight and strong, waving its great branches in the wind. If you look at the trunk of a Kodi, you will see that it has a smooth grey bark and that it is full of amber resin, which is called Cody gum. Many years ago, men used to search for this gum in the forks of the branches, and to dig for the fossil gum which lay in the ground, marking the place where Cody trees had flourished and died thousands of years before. It was fitting that the giant of the forest and the giant of the sea should become friends. Tohora swam close to the shore in the deep water below a forest-clad headland, and called to his friend Cody to come with him to the ocean. Come with me, he called. If you stay here, men will cut you down to make a waka. It is not safe for you to remain where you are. Cody shook his leafy arms. Who am I to care for such funny little men, he said proudly. They can do me no harm. Ah, said Tohora, you do not know. They may be small and insignificant, but their sharp ponamu axes will bite into you and their fire will burn you. Come with me while there is still time. No, Tohora, Cody replied. If I were to invite you to live here with me, you would lie helpless on the ground. Your weight would keep you pressed to the earth, and you would not move as you do in the oceans. And if I were to follow you, I would be tossed about by the storms. I would float helplessly on the water. My leaves would drop off, and in the end, I would sink down to the silent home of Tangaroa. I would no longer see the bright sun, and feel the soft rain on my leaves, and no longer would I stand up to fight the wind while my roots held me strong and firm on Papatuanuku. Tohora thought for a while. What you say is true, he said at length. Yet, you are my friend. I want to help you. I want you to remember me. Let us change our skins in order that we may remember each other. To this, Cody agreed. He gave his bark to Tohora and clothed himself in the skin of the whale, which is smooth and grey. And the giant tree is as full of resin as its friend the whale is full of oil. The Wandering Trees of the Plain there were once two cabbage trees which bore the long name Te Whakawewe a Natoro Irangi. Too long a name, you might think, for two wind-blown cabbage trees on the lonely Kainaroa plain. But listen first to the ancient tale. Many hundreds of years before Pākehā came and planted exotic pines on the beer tableland, the famous tohunga of the Aroa canoe, Natoro Irangi, travelled across it with his sisters. They came from Hawaii. They were women who held in their hands powers of fire and darkness and magic. Their names were Kuiwai and Honaroa. They were followed by their women servants who carried food, but they had no need to take water with them. For when they were thirsty, Natoro stamped with his foot and springs of clear water bubbled through the soil. Halfway across the plain, they stopped for a meal. Honoroa was hungry after plodding for so many miles across the dusty pumice land, and she continued to eat long after her brother and sister had finished. The woman who had carried the food laughed at her and whispered together, What a long time Honoroa is taking over her meal! From that day, the plain was known as the Kainaroa a Honoroa, the long meal of Honoroa. It was no laughing matter to the fierce woman Tohunga, she was angry with her slaves and turned on them with biting words and heavy blows, driving them before her like the wind. Fear carried them beyond her reach, but she called down a worse fate and changed them into cabbage trees. There are no other tea or cabbage trees like them in all the breadth and length of Aotearoa. They did not fasten their roots into the earth, but were condemned to wander homeless and lost, forever on the plain where Honoroa had taken so long to finish her meal. The Māori called them Ti Whakawewe, the wandering cabbage trees of Natoro Irangi. Travellers would see them from afar, but they retreated before them, only to appear suddenly in the mists that swirled across the pumice lands, and to follow them in the distance. After some time, having grown old and tired, 
they rooted themselves and grew into tall, big trees. From here, they met their deaths. One to a tokipotangata of a rangatira, and the other to the steel blade of a Pakeha's axe. The joke they had shared so briefly at Honoroa's expense was over and peace had come at last. The Hino of Ruatahuna The women of Tuhoi who wanted babies resorted to a tree that had been made fruitful by one of their ancestors. It was a venerable tree, known as Teiho o Kataka, and it had flourished for many years on a forest-clad ridge. A visitor, whose name was Kataka, had raised his hand to pluck some berries from this Hino tree, when he heard a voice which said, Do not eat my berries, I am the life spirit of your child. Kataka obeyed the voice, which told him that the tree was sacred to his children. The centuries passed slowly by, and still the Hino tree stood on the ridge, and many stories were told of its power. Childless wives whispered to each other that the way to be sure of achieving motherhood was to go to the Iho of Kataka and to clasp the trunk of the tree in their arms. Secretly, they went there in the early morning or in the dusky evenings, accompanied by their husbands and a tohunga who showed them what to do. The side on which the rising sun shone was the male side, and where it sets was the female. So the young mother who wants a man-child clasps the tree on its eastern side, while the one who needs a daughter, for there were a few women who, strangely enough in the eyes of their friends, preferred a girl to be born to them, went to the western side of the tree, which brought new life to the world in their bodies. The Singing Pahutakawa Of other trees we could tell, of the Pahutakawa that guards the entrance to the underworld at Cape Reanga, of the wishing tree of Hinehopu, or of the Manuka at Fakatane, which was said to be the most sacred object in the land. But let us end our stories with the tale of Tapuwai, the wind omen tree of Oho Kaka Bay in Rotoiti. It hangs gnarled and ancient, still gaily flaunting its scarlet blooms in summer over the edge of a tall cliff. When the branches murmured drowsily like Nardo the blowfly, it was a sign that there would be fair weather and blue skies. But if it whispered in the soft breezes, it was a warning of rain and wind. Sometimes the whisper song rose to a shrill screaming, and fishermen on the lake would paddle quickly when they heard it, because they knew that a storm was coming. There is magic in the trees, strong magic in all the children of Tane, since the god of nature claimed them for his children, nurturing them with water and the dark soil of Papatuanuku, and peopling them with his other best-loved creation, Manu. Birds. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. This podcast is a one-man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, buy merch, or give us a review. It means a lot and help spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. And since this is the last episode of 2020, I would like to make special thanks uh, to the patrons who have supported me along the way, especially given everything that has happened this year. So let's run through them all right now. Elizabeth, Aaron, Christina, Helen, Trot, Adam, Neville, Sherilyn, Jenny, Ruaeri, Veronica, Lance, Derva Derverson, Lucas, Andrew V, Brett, Lance, I Zero B Zero, Liam, Rachel, Zapora, Megan, Katie and OT, Kara, Robert, The Oob, Nicholas, Cheryl, Scott, Megan, Lars, Patrick, Rachel, Eric, Anne, Bynich, Michelle, Karen and Dominic. That was all one take and definitely the first take that I did. But all jokes aside, thank you very much for supporting the show. It is very much appreciated. You are the guys that really make this thing happen for not just yourselves, but everyone else that gets to listen. So thank you once again, and I look forward to bringing you more New Zealand history in 2021 and beyond. The next episode after this one is scheduled to be released on the weekend of the 3rd of January. However, I will be taking that week off. There will be no new Hans content that week. 
There is two reasons for that. The first is that is the 3rd of January, the basically the week of the new year, and I do not know where in the country I will be at the time to actually record, as well as the fact that over the long year that has been 2020, I have never missed a release date. Yay me! So I'm taking the next one off as a bit of a pat on the back to myself, as well as a little bit of a break. So hopefully you don't miss me too much, but we will be back on the weekend of the 17th of January. As always, hari tu atu, hoki tu mai. Merikere mete, and have a safe and happy new year. See you next time.